Well, the question to always ask when we're reading the Bible, and especially when we come to a passage like this on a morning like this, is what is this chapter about? We always have to ask that question. Um, is it about Cornelius? Is it about Peter? Is it about angels? Is it about praying? Is it about food? Is, is, it, is it about types of food, visions? Well, be, before any applications that we would make, and, and before any, oh, I see this in the passage, which is all very good, before any of those things, we need to ask the question, what is this about? What did the Spirit of God write this for? And the answer in this chapter is, at a core, core level, the gospel, the importance of of the gospel to all people. But a layer up, it's, it's the gospel coming to the Gentiles. It, it, and I say coming to the Gentiles because it's to us. As I look around this room, I don't know for sure if there's any Jewish people here, but the majority of us are Gentiles. And this is when the gospel started really coming to the Gentiles. In the historical moment that we're in, we don't even think that way, do we? We just think, oh, well, I've heard the gospel all my life. The, the gospel's always been accessible to the Gentiles. No, it was not. And this is a major pivot moment where it's not just Cornelius, a Gentile, who's going to receive the gospel, but it's Peter, a Jew, who needs to be converted to even believe that that's acceptable to do so. So that's what this chapter is all about. This was a very brand new thing, and change was hard. Do you know what hasn't changed? That change is hard <laughs> in all areas of our life. But this was a major change, and it was hard for that early Jewish church. So that's what this chapter is about, and next week we will get into how the Holy Spirit convinced the significant leader named Peter and that this change was supposed to be a part of his huge leadership role in, in, in doing so. Um, but here's what I saw then in verses 1 to 8. And, and this is why we broke it up. We could have told the whole story of Cornelius, but I really saw something significant in verses 1 to 8. And it's this, God does not always work in our box. I don't know about you. But there's times that I have a narrow conception of things. And, and that limits how I see God. Our narrow conception narrows the bigness of God in our minds and in our hearts. Does that make sense? So, we're going to start with an open book quiz. You're allowed to use your Bibles. Okay? Um, in Acts chapter 8, 9, and 10... There are three salvation stories, or three faith stories, and all of them are unlikely. All of them are, are really outside the box. I mean, one is a Jewish person, but the other two are Gentiles. So, feel free to look at your, your Bible. It's an open book quiz. Who was the person who came to faith in chapter 8? I'll give you a hint. Eritrea. Good guess, but no. From? Ethiopian eunuch, right? That was chapter 8. Who came to faith in chapter 9? Saul. Saul, right? That was his Hebrew name. Later would be changed to a Greek name, Paul. In chapter 10, who came to faith? Cornelius, that's right. Now, Unlikely stories, every one of them, every one of them. When I was 14 years old, in the summer of 1976, the city of New York was held hostage by this fellow called Son of Sam. Some who are older may remember the story. His name was David Berkowitz. And the reason he was called Son of Sam, he was 24 years old, and uh, he would go around for that summer, and he would shoot people just sitting in cars. And I think he shot 14 or 15 people. Six of them died. 
And, and, and people were terrorized that summer. And when he first was caught, he told them that Jesus, he told the authorities, Jesus had told him to do it through his next door neighbor's dog named Sam. And so he got dubbed Son of Sam. He just turned 68 this past week. But in 1987, 10 years after he was incarcerated, David Berkowitz met Jesus and became Son of Hope. And for 35 years, he has consistently lived a very strong Christian life. He is a leader and elder in the church, the prison church that is there. And he spent the last 20 years working with outside groups on victim advocacy in a huge way. For the first number of decades, whenever it was his turn to uh, be looked at for parole, he said, no, Uh, society will never forgive me. I do not want to get out. I'm not even going to go to the hearings. In more recent years, because every two years he comes up for parole, he does go to the hearings and he says, There are thousands and thousands of young people that I would like to talk to. If you could allow me to do that, I'd be just so privileged. It turned out, and he changed his story after he became a Christian, he told the truth. He was on drugs. He was a part of a satanic cult. He was a very, very, very dark young man. Son of Sam, now son of hope. What an unlikely story. And when I read those stories and hear those stories, and I see the Ethiopian eunuch, and I see Saul, and I see Cornelius, and I think, my story's pretty likely. (laughs) I was a a six-and-a-half-year-old kid in a Christian home who came to faith one day. And I remember talking to a person one day who had a story that was unlikely. And when they heard that I came to faith as a a six-and-a-half-year-old, I hope this helps someone who was kind of born and raised in a Christian home and came to faith, or came to faith really young, Uh, That person said to me, and God has protected and preserved you in this unholy world all these years? I said, yeah. He said, that's a lot of power. You think it took a lot of power to save me? It took a lot of power to protect and preserve you in this dark world. And you know what? I've been pretty pretty pumped about my testimony ever since. (laughs) Because here's the point of it all. It's an encounter with the fully alive Jesus that matters. I mean, that is all that matters. And I just want to ask, do you have one? Do you have a story of encounter with Jesus? Um, Some of us saw a video that I think Karen sent out from Alistair Begg, and I, I was so moved by it. He talked about, you know, if you stand at heaven's gate one day, you know, you've heard that story, and Peter meets you at the gate. That's not how it works in the Bible, okay? It's like, if you know Jesus, it's absent from the body, present with the Lord, no pass, go, uh, collect $200, n- none of that, okay? You don't talk to Peter at the gate. But if, Alistair Begg said, if you were met at the gate and asked, why do you deserve to be in heaven? If you begin your response in the first person, lovingly and respectfully, you're missing it. Well, I'm here because I believe in this. I'm here because I trust in this. I'm continuing in my faith in Jesus. Only an answer in the third person is truly acceptable. I am here because he paid my debt. Because he stood in my place. Because he died for me. That's the only answer that will gain admission to heaven. And and, and then Alistair talked about the thief on the cross. Can you imagine the thief who came to faith from the cross and he gets to the gate and some angel says to him, so why would I let you in? Can you explain the doctrine of justification by faith? And he would say, I don't know what that is. Okay, Uh, can you tell me your thoughts on the hypostatic union of the God-man Jesus Christ? And he would say, I'm pretty sure I don't know what you just said. Okay, well then why are you here and why do you think that you're allowed into this place called heaven? And all the thief would say is because the man on the middle cross told me I could come. The man on the middle cross took care of it for me. 
He told me I could come. That's why I'm here. And if in your soul you have any other answer or response than that, may God's Spirit turn on the light in your soul today that that is the point of encounter with Jesus that you need. Because the sinless Savior died, my sinful soul is counted free, and God the just is satisfied to look on him and pardon me. That's the gospel that every one of us needs to preach to ourselves every day. Well, let's get into this story. Verse 1. And I I really am so enjoying these narratives in Acts. They, They almost begin with, once upon a time, right? Once upon a time. Although they are historically true. They're not a fairy tale. And many have been authenticated through archaeological finds. So it begins, at Caesarea... There was a man named Cornelius, a centurion in what was known as the Italian regiment. Who was Caesarea named after? Feel free to answer. Caesar. In fact, it was a major uh, headquarters or or outpost capital in in Palestine at the time for the Romans. And so it's named after Caesar. And when reading the Bible, you will come across Caesarea a number of times. And and if you look at some of the context, you think, wait a minute, those sound different. And indeed they are. One is uh, Caesarea Maritima, which is on the Mediterranean coast. And that's where this Caesarea is in verse 1. And then there's Caesarea Philippi that gets talked about quite a bit. I won't go into all the references, but that's to the north and, and to the east. And then we'll also be referencing in the story Joppa, which is a little to the south on the Mediterranean. So at Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion. So take a wild guess. How many men were under him if he was a centurion? A hundred. Century. A hundred. So he was a captain of a hundred men. And it's interesting. I looked up all the centurions in the New Testament. Always they're in a good light known for their honesty, their integrity, their moral goodness. In Matthew 8, a centurion uh, whose servant is dying comes to Jesus and has faith that Jesus can heal him from a distance. And Jesus says of the centurion, I haven't found faith like this in this Gentile in all of Israel. And then we have Cornelius the centurion here in Acts 10. In Acts 27, a centurion named Julius When Paul's on his ship and the ship wrecks, and some of them want to kill the prisoners, including Paul, Julius stands up and says, no, we're sparing this guy's life. And then the ultimate is in Matthew 27, a centurion at the cross of Jesus who says, truly, this was the Son of God. Wow, what a declaration from a human being, and that was from a centurion. Um, Bible scholar William Barclay says the centurions were the finest men in the Roman army. And that really is reflected in the scripture. But here's the point. Here's the point of this story is the gospel is crossing social and ethnic and political lines. And it's coming to a Roman leader in the military named Cornelius. God doesn't always work in our box. And uh, notice it says, known as the Italian Regiment. Anyone here, by show of hands, who grew up on the King James Version? I have my hand up. Okay, so you'll remember that it says, of the Italian band. Of the Italian band. And I remember as a teenager when I started getting interested in the Bible, and I'm reading through Acts, and I went, there was a rock band in the Bible. An Italian rock band. I wonder if they opened for the Beatles ever. Okay, I wasn't too bright at that time. But, yeah, they were of the Italian regiment. So, verse 2. He and all his family were devout and God-fearing. He gave generously to those in need and prayed to God regularly. God doesn't always work within our box. This is a really good moral person who, if we did not know better, we would say he must be a Christian. Right? I mean, look what, look what Cornelius has going for him. 
All of his family were devout. Devoted to God is what that means. All of his family were God-fearing. He gave generously to those in need. He prayed to God regularly. So Cornelius is obviously, don't get me wrong in this, he was a believer in God. I mean, it's very obvious. He was a believer in God. If Cornelius was actively living out his belief in God in this way, then he's going to be in heaven when he dies, right? What do you think? It's been a debate for millennia. Are humans good or are humans evil from birth? Is there some good in humans? Or are we a blank slate at birth and it's society that shapes us and makes us good or bad? Well, you know, I've thought about this question a lot and I've thought about, do I know any good people? Have I known any good people who, who were not of faith, who were not even religious? And I do. I have known good followers of Jesus. I have known good non-followers of Jesus. Hey, a few weeks ago, I asked if anyone knew Meatloaf, the band from the 70s, and boy, a lot of hands went up. Anyone remember the band Queen? Okay, they had a song, Only the Good Die Young. And I remember that song, and the older I get, I'm thinking, man, if that's true, I should be worried. (laughs) Right? Only the good die young. I had a boss once, for, for many years that I really, really, really loved, named Ken, and he never knew Jesus. He, was, uh, he, he would say he was of the Catholic faith, but he was what was called the c e Catholic man. Do you know what that is? Christmas and Easter. So that, that was it. That was the only time he darkened the doorstep of his church. But he told me that growing up in parochial schools, in, in a separate school all through the years, he said, I knew the very best and the very worst people I have ever known in my life. That's really stuck with me. He knew the very best, but he knew the very worst that he had ever known in his life. Well, here's the question. What does God's word say about this question? About human goodness. Well, here's just a sampling. In Psalm 51, verse 5, so think Cornelius, think you, think me. Surely I was sinful at birth. Sinful from the time my mother conceived me. You say, oh, that's just the psalmist beating up on himself. No, it's not. It's a timeless principle of Scripture taught by the Spirit of God. And then Paul, through the book of Romans, Romans 3, says, We have made the charge that Jews and Gentiles alike are all under the power of sin. As it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. Reminiscent of Isaiah 53. All we like sheep have turned away to our own way, right? Um, And there is no one who does good. Not even one. You say, wait a minute. But people do good things. Don't you do good things? I mean, some of you. Some of the time, right? And I do occasionally as well. Yeah, but look what Isaiah says under the inspiration of God about the good things that we do. In chapter 64, verse 6, all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. You've maybe heard of something called the doctrine of original sin. Those words are not in Scripture, but the Scriptures do teach it. And it goes like this. Humans, through the fact of birth... Inherit a tainted nature in need of regeneration or life and inherit a proclivity to sinful conduct. God's word consistently says this about the human family. It is our story. That we inherited from dad, Adam, and mom, Eve, a sin nature. Now, are there good living religious people all over the world in every culture? Absolutely. But every one of us are lost and dead in trespasses and iniquities. And what does dead mean? It means separated from God. We're separated from God. We didn't get that way. We were born that way. 
So as we look at Cornelius again, I, I'm, I'm saying all this to say, you know, we, we see Cornelius, we see all these things going for him, but he needed Jesus. He needed God's salvation. He needed a new heart. So do you. So do I. But isn't it interesting? Again, theologically, this is out of our box, that he's a not yet follower of Jesus who prayed regularly. Um, he was likely following the Jewish prayer rhythm of nine in the morning, noon, and three in the afternoon. In fact, we're going to see in verse nine when we get there about Peter, he was praying at noon. So here's, here's Cornelius praying at three in the afternoon. I don't know about you, but is that convicting? I mean, do we pray with a rhythm of at least three times a day so fervently and with deep belief like this? Our local mission Sunday a few weeks ago, there was a call from the Spirit to raise the prayer temperature among us. And I've heard people say that, you know, preaching like this is, is guilting people. We should never guilt people. Well, the Bible has another word for it. It's called conviction. <laughs> And conviction is not a bad thing. It's an uncomfortable thing, and that's why we don't like it. And I'm the first to say that the motivation for everything we do as followers of Jesus should always be devotion to Jesus. But if God's Spirit has to get us there through conviction, well, that's what he does. That's what he does. Well, here's this man. He's praying three times a day in verse 3. One day at about 3 in the afternoon, he had a vision. So God speaks to Cornelius while he's praying. You say, it doesn't say he's praying there. Yes, but in verse 30, when he retells the story to Peter, he says, I was praying. So we know that he was praying. So God speaks to him while he's praying. And next week, we're going to see that while Peter's praying, God gives him a vision. Now, I'm not extremely smart, but what's the common denominator for God speaking in both cases? Anyone? Yeah. Praying. God does not always work in our box. Do you know that God can speak to you when you're praying? And he can speak to you when you're reading your Bible. And he can speak to you as we sing, because we sing truth to one another. If the content is such that, you know, there's biblical truth there. But all of these things, praying, reading the scripture, singing, they put us within the vocal range of God. And I'm the first to say that every time I pray, I don't always hear from God, but there are times that I do. And in fact, that happened just inside of two weeks ago. I was praying one day specifically about the merger, the possibility of the Grace Radiant merger, and God dropped into my heart something I wasn't even think about, thinking about, and he said, you have never in your lifetime, Gord, had an opportunity to work toward giving expression to the unity of my body like you have in this moment. And it took me by surprise, and I, I thought about it and prayed into it, and I thought, I've been a part, Karen and I have been a part of many March for Jesus movements where we would march with a whole group of people from the church in Guelph, all, all churches in Guelph. As a youth leader, we had many events with many stripes of churches involved, but God said, no, you've never had a moment like this. You think about it, young and old today, have you ever had a moment like this one where we, we have the opportunity to work toward giving expression to the unity of the body of Christ like we have in this moment? And I'll tell you what that did for me. That, that, that fueled the fire for me to keep working, to see where this is going. But what are we doing in this moment? And do we recognize that it's something God might be calling us to? Well, in his prayer, what happens? He had a vision. He distinctly saw an angel of God who came to him, came to him and said, Cornelius. Don't answer it loud, but do you ever feel like people don't really know you? God knows you. Angels know you. They know your name. And if one were to appear and call you by name, I think you'd have the same reaction I would have and Cornelius had, and that is a lot of fear. But think about it. You are known and you're fully loved. So Cornelius, in verse 4, he stared at him. What, what is it, Lord? 
And the angel answered, Your prayers and gifts to the poor have come up as a memorial offering before God. Again, this is not in a category that I normally think of. Non-believers, their prayers, their giving, God recognizes that in his presence. It's amazing. I, I remember as a young person, you know the way young people, I know I'm looking at some of you, but when I was a young person, always in debate, right? How many angels can dance on the pin of a needle head? That was a brilliant waste of time to talk about that. And, and that's an age-old argument. And so many doctrines that we wrestled with, and, and they're interesting and fun, but sometimes they're just meaningless conversations, to be honest. And so this question, I remember, was hotly debated in, in the circles I was in. Believers only are heard by God. And, you know, citing various scriptures where in Jesus' name the Father hears us and so on. Well, just look at verse 4. God, don't put God in a box. God obviously hears all people's prayers, all heart cries. He hears them. He hears them. And so the interesting thing is that God sees that and says, you're fine. I'm not going to do anything more for you, Cornelius. No, he's now going to bring the gospel, the good news of Jesus to him. But the question is, why didn't the angel present the gospel to Cornelius? I mean, you've got an angel. <laughs> How much better spokesman for the gospel are you going to get than an angel? But the angel's saying, I'm going to be handing this off to a human named Peter. And you know, it tends to be that that's how God works. And again, I'm not putting God in a box. He can work however he, he will. But have you ever prayed for a relative? Have you ever prayed for a friend or a neighbor? And you've even prayed that God would give them a vision? That's great. But you know what God's likely going to do? He's likely going to send someone to them with the gospel. And watch out, it could be you. <laughs> As we pray for our friends and neighbors, he often sends us to them. So in verse 5, now send men to Joppa. This is the angel talking to, to uh, Cornelius. Now send men to Joppa to bring back a man named Simon who's called Peter. He's staying with Simon the Tanner whose house is by the sea. There are a lot of specifics in this vision. This is a very clarifying kind of vision. Like, what am I supposed to do now? This is ABC. Verse 7, when the angel who spoke to him had gone, Cornelius called two of his servants and a devout soldier who was one of his attendants. He told them everything that had happened, and he sent them south to Joppa to find this guy named Simon, who was at some other guy named Simon's house. And we're going to see the rest of the story next week. In closing, in closing, God does not always work in our box. Cornelius had a connection with God that was religious, but he did not know Jesus. And I want to ask you, do you? Do you have a religious connection with Jesus? Maybe you pray, you read, you give, you're faithful. Do you remember that Jesus in Matthew 25, in, on the judgment day, he will have people come to him and say, I did all those things, Lord, Lord. And he, he will say, I never knew you. I never knew you. I don't want that said about me by Jesus. I want him to know me. I want to know him in this life. Now, Cornelius was responsive to the light he had been given, to the revelation he'd been given. And God's spirit then brought the gospel to him. I remember years ago uh, reading the story uh, told by Amy Carmichael, a missionary in India, of a woman named Mimosa. I don't know if anyone here has ever read that, that story. It's worth picking up that book. But Mimosa was a woman who lived in a tribal village in India. And when, when um, the, the villagers would bow down to a, a god that they'd made, an idol that they'd made for the sun, she would say, how could whoever made the sun be reduced to an idol? And when they would bow down to an idol of fire, she would say, how could the God who made fire, or the being that made fire, ever be reduced to something we build with our hands? Like, she just was responding, like Romans 1, the glory of God is a voice to, to her soul. And, and it was, so much so that she got ostracized she could no longer live in the village. She had her own little 
living space at the edge of the village. And when missionaries came along, who do you think was the first one to embrace this God? They could not be explained through idolatry. Mimosa was. It's an amazing story. But I've often wondered, and I, this is a big theological question, if she had died that way, having responded to the light of God that she'd been given, having never heard of Jesus, would she be covered by the blood of Christ? I don't know. I don't know. I know that Romans 1 seems to fit that category, but praise God, people like that in this world, God's spirit does bring, many of them, does bring the gospel to them. But here's what I, I want to leave you with. God is sovereignly preparing Cornelius to hear the gospel and to receive the message. God has to prepare a person to truly become a believer and then ultimately a receiver of Jesus. So I want to ask you, do you have people in your life that you're just longing that they'll know Jesus? You have sons and daughters and sisters and brothers and neighbors and friends, and you're longing for them to know Jesus. Well, keep praying, because God is doing a work of preparation in them, and only he can do that work. Salvation is God's from start to middle to finish. And I had not intended to tell this story, but Karen's grandfather, on her mom's side, was a very hard-hearted man. And when his wife came to faith in Jesus, he thought, oh, that's nice. Your life will get better, but it's not for me. And when one by one, many of his children came to faith, including Karen's mom, he thought, oh, that's nice, but I don't want anything to do with that. But do you know what his wife did? Every single week when she would clean the house and clean the bathroom, she would take a little gospel pamphlet and she'd put it on the back of the toilet on the water closet. She'd set it right there, nice and straight. And for 40 plus years, it never moved. Like she would change it every week, a new one every week, but it never ever moved. He never read them. And one year before he died, at age 72, he died at 73. At age 72, guess where Jesus met Grandpa Cottrell? In the john, on the toilet, reading the gospel pamphlet, and guess what he told his wife? I read every one of them every week for 40 years. And I wouldn't give you the satisfaction of knowing that I was, so I always put it back exactly the way I felt. How hard-hearted is that? And yet God's spirit was at work. It's amazing. And next week we're going to see that not only does God have to prepare the person who receives the gospel, he even has to prepare the people bringing the gospel. And that's what he's going to do with Peter. He's going to renovate his heart. I leave you with this, John 1 and, 9, and, and 12. To all who not just believe in Jesus, Cornelius believed in God, but to all who receive him, to those who believe in, trust in his name, he gives the right to become children of God. Let's just pray into that right now. And um, would you think deeply about your own soul and where you are with God? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word that is like a searchlight. It just shines so brightly into our lives. And it's uncomfortable because it exposes so much. But Lord, you are behind that searchlight and you love us. God, we just look at what you did by sending your son and we know beyond a shadow of doubt that you love us. So search me, O oh God. See if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Lord, I, I pray for my friends today that are here online and in person. God, if we have religiously had a relationship with you all these years, God, today, would you open our hearts and our eyes to the reality that we need to take our place as the sinner for whom Jesus died. And may we say to him right now, I not only believe in you, Jesus, and who you are, but I receive you now as my Lord, my King, and my Savior. I want you to come into my life. Would you do that right now? 
Would you change me, transform me? Be my life leader, be my king. I surrender my life to you now. I don't know what that will mean for my future, but I choose to trust you now. Would you do that today? In Jesus' name.